Good afternoon on this Sunday, August 17th. I'm Yuna Nofed. These are today's headlines. Two abducted ISF members are freed by RSL militants after Lebanese officials urged an indication of goodwill on their part of the captors before carrying out negotiation requests. The UCC says it might reconsider the correction of official exams. UCC head Nehmi Mahfoud said that the union acts in according with what is best for students. Kurdish military forces known as Kushmerja reclaimed three towns on the way to Iraq's largest dam after a series of U.S. airstrikes. Two abducted ISF members have been freed by Arsal militants after Lebanese officials urged an indication of goodwill on their part of the captors before carrying out negotiation requests. Officials say they will begin to tackle the requests of the militants as soon as they show a sign of goodwill. This is according to Adnan Amama, the member of the Muslim Scholars Committee. The released ISF members, Midjan Hassan and Kamal Misilmani, were transferred by the Muslim Scholars Committee to Army Intelligence, who then transported them to the Abra barracks. He added that political and security officials have promised to improve the humanitarian situation in Arsil, vowing to normalize the situation in the border region. According to Amama, the militants are requesting better treatment for refugees and Arsil residents who were wounded during the clashes. A total of 38 members of security forces, 22 of them Lebanese and 19 policemen, were taken captive by militants in Arsil. Mary Knight Patriarch Sharadai is lauding the principles of diversity and coexistence that are a characteristic, he's saying, of the National Pact. And he's adding that all components of Lebanese society constitute an added value to a united national fabric. The National Pact is like the spirit of the Lebanese entity, said Ra'i, highlighting that it is based on a rejection of religious theocracy as well as atheistic secularization. The Patriarch spoke on the core principles of the National Pact, saying that the Lebanese have embodied all its components through an equal power-sharing formula between the Christians and the Muslims in the fields of governance and administration. He also added that Lebanon is fully independent with an Arabic identity and belonging. The UCC might reconsider the correction of official exams, according to UCC head Nehmi Mahfoud, saying that the union acts in accordance with what is best for students. The UCC head said he was aware that the education minister was using issuing passing certificates as a pressure card against the union, but with the issuance of the certificates, the UCC is reconsidering what is best for students and might also consider correcting the exams. Mahmoud said that the UCC will hold General Assembly meetings on Monday and Tuesday in which a decision will be made regarding the correction of the exams. Meanwhile, Education Minister Elias Boussab decided on Saturday to issue passing certificates to thousands of students who took official exams after efforts failed to convince teachers to back down on their boycott. A residential building was evacuated overnight in a Tripoli neighborhood when its foundations began to shake, leading the inhabitants to fear its collapse at any moment. Located in the Karam al area, the weakening al muhajirin building lies just next to Karami Palace in the northern city. The sudden deterioration started half an hour after midnight on Sunday, and soon after that, Tripoli's municipality police was there to help in the evacuation. The officers used megaphones to call on all residents to flee the building and keep a good distance from it in case of a sudden downfall. Saudi Arabia Ambassador to Lebanon Ali Awad Asidi stresses that Lebanon's stability and security should be a red line. He told the radio, we will not allow the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant or any other group to impose itself on decisions in Lebanon, adding that he hoped the unrest that was witnessed in Arsaid will not be repeated in any other region in Lebanon. This unrest, he said, should prompt Lebanese to fortify and to unify the country. Clashes broke out on August 2nd between the army and Islamist gunmen in Arsil in the wake of the arrest of a prominent member of a Nusra Front, Imad Juma. A number of soldiers were killed and wounded as well in the unrest that ended with a ceasefire on August 7th. The deadline for the elaborate bodies to sign a decree to participate in the parliamentary elections will end tomorrow, as Interior Minister Nuhad Mashnu said that he has performed his duties regarding staging the polls. And Nahar Daily reported that he has completed all his responsibilities and has sent the decree to cabinet within the legal deadline. According to Article 44 of the Elections Law, the decree should be signed by 24 ministers in accordance with the mechanism adopted by cabinet. 
Lebanon will enter on August 20th a deadline to agree on a new electoral law ahead of the elections. Zahla MP Nicola Fatouche proposed a Tuesday a draft law for extending Parliament's term by more than two years. Kurdish military forces known as Peshmerga have retaken three towns on the way to Iraq's largest dam after a series of U.S. airstrikes. Officials told that Peshmerga captured Tel Skouf, about 15 kilometers east of the Mosul Dam, from Islamic State fighters earlier this morning. The town is one of several seized by the Islamic State, the group of self-declared jihadists who have captured large parts of land in northern Iraq and Syria. The U.S. launched airstrikes near the cities of Mosul and Erbil to push back the fighters, but the scope of the strikes has been limited. The Mosul Dam fell under control of the Islamic State fighters earlier this month. Control of the dam could give the fighters the ability to flood cities and cut off vital water and electricity supplies. Airstrikes on Saturday targeted positions near Erbil and Mosul. Coming up next, Israel will not agree to any long-term ceasefire in Gaza, according to Prime Minister Netanyahu. More world news when we return. Welcome back. The Islamic State group has executed 700 members of a tribe it has been battling in eastern Syria during the past two weeks, the majority of them civilians. The killing spree happened in several villages inhabited by the Al Shaita tribe in Deir Zur province, where the tribes are from. This is all according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. The silence of the international community is unbelievable, they say, and there is no excuse for them to keep a blind eye on what is happening in Syria. The observatory added many of the victims who were Shaita tribesmen were beheaded after they were captured by the Islamic State group. Among the members of the Shaita tribe killed were 100 fighters, but the rest were civilians. The activist group opposes, of course, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and reports according to witnesses on the ground. Israel will not agree to any long-term ceasefire in Gaza at indirect talks in Cairo unless its security needs are clearly met. This is what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, adding that the Israeli delegation in Cairo is acting with a very clear mandate to stand firmly on Israel's security needs. He said this to ministers at the start of the weekly cabinet meeting in Jerusalem. And then he added that only if there is a clear answer to Israel's security needs, only then will they agree to reach an understanding. This comes as Israel's negotiating team made its way back to Cairo for indirect talks with the Palestinians over a long-term arrangement to end more than a month of bloodshed in Gaza. The Egyptian broker talks, which were due to resume today, are taking place during a five-day lull in fighting between Israeli and Gaza's Hamas de facto rulers, which is due to expire at midnight on Monday. Kenya is closing its borders to travelers from Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, the three countries worst hit by the Ebola outbreak, according to the government. Kenya Airways also announced that it would suspend its flights to Freetown and Monrovia when the government travel ban on passengers comes into effect on Wednesday. Several European carriers have already suspended services to the Sierra Leonean and Liberian capitals, where states of emergency have been declared to try to slow the spread of the disease. Kenyan Health Minister James Machuria said the measure was also aimed at travelers who have passed through the affected countries. The measure does not affect health workers fighting the epidemic nor Kenyans returning home from the three countries. However, he did warn that both groups would be subject to strict checks and it may be necessary to put people in quarantine. A Ukrainian fighter jet has been shot down while flying over rebel-held territory in the rest of East as Kiev is accusing Moscow of supplying rebels with a convoy of rocket launchers. Ukraine's military blamed pro-Russian separatists of shooting down the MIG-29 jet this morning close to the Russian border. The military said the pilot had ejected and had been found alive and well after a search. Hours later, Ukraine's military spokesman said a convoy of rocket launchers had crossed over from Russia in the past 24 hours. Now, Ukraine is accusing Russia of sending three Grad missile systems and Russian drones of violating Ukrainian airspace on 10 occasions. In the United States, one person has been shot and critically wounded and seven have been arrested as police in Ferguson in the state of Missouri 
clashed with protesters when a curfew was imposed following days of unrest over the killing of an 18-year-old Michael Brown. Violence flared briefly this morning as a group of protesters defied the order. Linda Tamim has the details. One person was shot and critically wounded, and seven people were arrested early this morning as police in Ferguson, Missouri, clashed with protesters when a curfew was imposed following days of unrest over a black teenager being shot dead by a white police officer. Scores of demonstrators remained in the street past curfew, chanting, no justice, no curfew, no peace, while law enforcement officials equipped in riot gear and armored cars fired smoke canisters and used loudspeakers to warn protesters to disperse immediately. Governor Jay Nixon had declared a state of emergency and announced a five-hour curfew after a week of racially charged protests and looting over the shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson on August 9th. As governor, I'm committed to making sure the forces of peace and justice prevail. So to protect the people and property of Ferguson today, I signed an order declaring a state of emergency and ordering the implementation of a curfew. In the, in the impact in the curfew in the impacted area of Ferguson. Again, this is not to silence the people of Ferguson or this region or others, but to contain those who are drowning out the voice of the people with their actions. We will not allow a handful of looters to endanger the rest of this community. Nevertheless, critics say skin color played an important role in the shooting case as well as the following riots. Many of the protesters say they have had similar experiences as Michael Brown and his family. Within my family, we call the police terrorists because that's the way we feel. We feel terrorized. I'm here because I've experienced the same thing with the state of Missouri. My mother has been abused. She died while under the guardianship of the public administrator. The public administrator has lied and told people that I'm violent and that I am uh, violent and that I am uh, dangerous. I am not violent or dangerous. I just want to make sure that my mother's justice is served. Tensions in Ferguson flared late on Friday after police released the name of the officer who fatally shot Brown and documents alleging the teenager robbed a store before he died. Brown's family and supporters have demanded that Officer Darren Wilson be held accountable. The U.S. Department of Justice is investigating the shooting for any civil rights violation, and the St. Louis County Police Department has also launched a probe. And on that note, we end our bulletin for today. Let me remind you of our top stories. Two abducted ISF members are freed by ISL militants after Lebanese official urged an indication of goodwill on their part of the captors before carrying out negotiation requests. UCC says it might reconsider the correction of official exams. According to the head, Nami Mahfoud, he said the union acts in accordance with what is best for students. And Kurdish military forces known as Peshmerja reclaimed three towns on the way to Iraq's largest dam after a series of U.S. airstrikes. This ends the bulletin for this week. Join me again tomorrow for 24. It's making news here and around the world. Have a good one.